Hello and welcome back to Have Your Say, one on one shadow boxing. We're still with Robin Chappell from the West Australian Greens and start to discuss some other important issues apart from the cheating of the tax by the big nationals. But uh, the last thing on the gas industry, now because this uh, critical mass of misery of not having enough grass in Australia for the domestic market. And uh, they're planning to build an infrastructure, a gas pipe, mm -hmm. from WA to Queensland and to Victoria and to so on and so forth. What do you think about that? Look, I, I think we need to put in perspective. Yes. We are the largest global supplier of liquefied natural gas. But we actually don't have any gas. Pardon? Because we actually have to convert our gas into liquefied natural gas to get it to market. Saudi Arabia, Russia, everybody else pipes their gas. Yes. But in fact, the Australian uh, continent, as far as it goes, only has 1.9% of world supply. We actually we've got guess. very little gas in a global context. So we always jump up and down and say, we're the world's biggest producer of LNG. But we actually don't have very much gas. So there is an argument made by Dom Gas and many other people yes. that we should be looking after our gas for ourselves yes. rather than selling it offshore cheaply. As liquefied and cheap. And that's right. So, um, so what's I, happening with this proposed Look, I, my concern is yes. that if you put the pipeline across, um, that would take more gas out of what is a fairly limited supply. It isn't going to last forever in a day. Not. Um, so eventually you're going to have a gas pipeline going over to the eastern states, which isn't going to have any gas in it. So don't build that <laughs> pipeline. Yeah. So in the long term, but it if, just doesn't make economic no, sense. No, but if they want to have some liquefied gas, they should have it. Sh send ship, it around by ship. Ship it, and that's it. Is sending and gas it. by ship, believe it or not, cheaper. is cheaper than piping it. I know that, but I'm happy to hear that from you yeah. as well. Oh, look, I mean, and it's, it's, just on that note, on the gas pipeline, we not even have two gas pipelines from the Kimberley to here to yeah. supply West Australia with gas. Are we going to have another one? Because we know what's happened when, when we got this one sort of broken. Yeah, Varanus. So what's happening there? Well, we, is our we, we actually do have, we used to have one pipeline. Yeah. And then what they've done over time is they've actually built two they do it in loops. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've virtually got two all the way now, but they're looped off the main pipeline. Now, the pipeline performs two functions. One is to transport Deliver, gas, yep. but it actually acts as a reservoir. Um, and we actually need that reservoir capacity. 43% of energy in Western Australia um, in the southwest interconnected grid comes from gas. Um, if you suddenly get a series of hot days, the first hot day is not a problem. But by day eight or ten, you've drawn down the pressure head yep. in the pipeline, the reservoir, mm -hmm. to the point where it starts having problems With firing delivering. the turbines. <laughs> but since they've done those loops and expanded the reserve capacity, we I think we've got past that. Plus the fact um, that we've now got excess capacity uh, of electricity in the southwest interconnected grid. We brought on back on Muja A and B two dysfunctional, old, clapped out uh, coal fired power stations, yep. and then we discovered we didn't need them. So they're sitting there chugging away doing nothing virtually. As a reserve now. We can use that as a reserve. Can you we? can use it as a reserve, but reserves need what we call instant capacity. Turn it off, on, that's it. That's right. You can't do, do that, that with a coal-fired power station. No, no you it have takes to run it. hours to ramp it up. And yes. It hours to ramp it but down. But better than nothing if you really got a problem, I think. Well, we actually had, we'd already resolved that problem because we actually had a program called demand side management mm -hmm. where there was something like about 130 corporations had signed a contract that they would operate as de facto power stations and if we were running short on energy, those factories would all turn themselves off and be paid for not consuming power. Okay. And that enabled 
the rest of the grid to, to keep function. the lights on. Okay, so we got some security development. Oh, that, well and truly. But um, if something but we really still don't need those coal-fired yeah. power stations. No, but we got it. So yeah. we got double secured yeah. if you really something really happened. Right. Uh, but uh, we still got one pipeline because if the pipeline need to be shut down, reservoirs here, there, uh, still one pipeline. Well, what they've done with these loops yes. is so if you need to take out one section, it bypasses. Uh, and that was part of the reason. If um, that section is that's damaged. But yeah. if the other one, which is not have the loops, then it's not that easy. That's right. However, we can uh, transport liquid yep. to here, to uh, Perth, or I not. don't think we've actually got a receival point um, in Western Australia where you can de-liquefy the gas. But should we have one? Uh, I really don't think so. I mean... So what's the energy future then? Oh, if the energy future is obviously renewables. I mean, they're coming in so cheaper exponentially by the day whether it be the new solar systems, whether it be the new uh, uh, battery systems. Yeah. I mean, we're all talking about lithium batteries, but we're already starting to move beyond those Absolutely. already into, Absolutely. into new systems. So the economics uh, around renewables are there now. So why do you not thinking about nuclear energy? Look, You hate that. Yeah, and we <laughs> hate it for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm... Lucky enough, I used to be uh, on the Radiation Health Council out of Melbourne for yes. Panzer. So I used to go over and meet and discuss uh, nuclear-related issues all the time. It isn't economic. Um, if you look at, uh, the again, the Swedish proposals, they're something like about $5 billion over budget. Uh, they were going to be the new state-of-the-art five years ago. They still haven't been completed. The economics, you can't insure them. The state is the only people who can afford to insure them. Um, and states are the only people who can afford to build them. The private sector won't. It's just too expensive. It's too expensive. So that's one of the reasons? That's one of the reasons. But, I mean, okay, there are more fundamental reasons from our perspective. We have Us to remember... principles? That, well, the nuclear industry came about because we needed to develop atomic bombs. There was no desire originally to actually turn these nuclear power stations um, into energy producers. They were just there to generate plutonium so we could make atomic bombs. And the world's worst nuclear accident was in Chelyabinsk in Russia, not Chernobyl. Ch Chelyabinsk? Yeah. Um, Where's that? In, in, in 1972, yes. they were building lots of power stations in the Maya region and, and Chelyabinsk region and uh, to generate plutonium. But then they had a lot of waste, so they decided to bury the waste. And we didn't know about this until many years later. Uh, a, a defector from Russia rolled up in America and sort of said, oh, you, you know all these massive tests they've been doing on cohorts of 500 swans yeah. and how they're affected by radiation? Well, that's in Chelyabinsk because you can't live there. It's a completely desolate area. We don't actually quite know what happened, but they buried a whole heap of nuclear waste. Yes. Um, and either it, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Either it had a spontaneous um, reaction, reaction, yeah, uh, or it got so hot that it boiled the water underground, and we had a steam explosion. Which is but either way, it was a massive yes. explosion, a lot of radioactive material over that region. You can actually drive through the region currently. There's a sign on the road as you enter the area. That's your responsibility. <laughs> drive through to the other side and don't get out. <laughs> but it was most probably um, one of the, the worlds, other than Fukushima, which is now worse than uh, Chernobyl in so Chernobyl. many ways. But forget the accidents. The, the risks are always there, and it's going to be uh, largely, to a degree, human... Uh, At all. Uh, error that's going to yes. cause a problem. Um, we keep on talking uh, in the nuclear industry, oh, we're going to build 30, 60 new reactors. Well, those 30 to 60 new nuclear reactors have been on the drawing board for the last 50 years. So there's not, nothing major. Nothing really. I yeah. haven't built a new nuclear reactor in the United States. Uh, no. uh, I think the last, uh, in 1972, was the last one they built. Um, so... No, it isn't economic, but 
It also provides, unfortunately, the feedstock for nuclear weapons. Now, we're going to sell some of our uranium to India. Well, India's got a lot of uranium itself, but we're actually saying you can't use our Into uranium it. for nuclear weapons, so they're not going to do that. They're going to use their uranium they for nuclear weapons and, and this our one for uranium generating. for reactors. The last question before we go, and it's a must one. How do you see the so-called Aboriginal problem to be solved in WA? It's got so the, many legs. The, the, I don't like the word Aboriginal problem for a start off. I think it's a European problem. Um, mm, I have to share that with you. Yes, it is. <laughs> so um, it, it, we actually, as a society, have to come together and work with all the different uh, communities that are in Australia. We cannot isolate one community through any particular race, creed or colour. We have to remember that we're working with people who have a culture that in many ways is far and away uh, more deeply entrenched and more valuable than the culture we've got. We've got a throwaway culture. We've got a culture of let's go to the cinema every night, all this sort of thing. Um, taking people off the land to save themselves actually goes against one of the most fundamental things. Now, I go back to my time in the early 70s when I was working out in the central desert and quite often at Papania, a place I used to work at, we'd find uh, uh, a woman who was going to have a breech birth. So we'd go into an absolute panic and we'd send her to Alice Springs. Um, so she's in a decent hospital to have the child. A few days later, she would walk the 250 kilometres back to Papania because it was more important that the child was born on the place where their culture was. Um, it didn't matter to that individual if they died or on the way didn't, they didn't make it. But it was far more important than to go That's through the agonies of a breech birth at Papania so the connection to country. I go back to another statement. Many, many years ago, I was very privileged to go out in the desert with an old man called Nosbek Jupurula. He was actually the man who found Lasseter's body. And we are sitting down one day and he said, the trouble you white fellas, you want to own land. You'll never get it until you understand that the land owns us. So we've got to accept the relationship between Aboriginal people and the land and the land and Aboriginal people. Once we've done that, and we get that through our thick heads, um, then we might start actually understanding what drives um, the culture of Indigenous people. Now, we have to remember that there were some 500 and odd different nations here in Australia. We didn't call them the Nalama, we didn't call them the Yarrabarara, uh, Bunaba, whatever, Wongatu, um, uh, the, the mob round here, the Noirs, we didn't call them that. We called them all Aboriginal people and we expected them all to be exactly the same. same. They aren't. Aboriginal people have quite different cultures, quite different laws, um, they have different languages. For example, uh, good uh, in desert language is Balia. Um, if you go to the top of uh, Australia, it's Miritiri Maimak. Now, there's no difference. synergy, no similarity at all. Um, so what do you think? We got a hope or they yeah. have a hope? What we have to do is to recognise the different nations in Australia um, and respect them for their individual cultures and work with them, not against them. Many, many programmes have been rolled out from a Perth-centric basis out into the regions based on their experience with a, a Noongar Aboriginal people out here and they're trying to impose the same sort of negotiation and structure with exactly. a Matu person out in the desert. It's, not it's a bit like trying to get the same rules in Sweden as you've got in Ireland or Italy. You know, it just isn't going to work. That's what they tried with the European Union and this is not working now, no, definitely. That's a so, few problems too. <laughs> on that note, thank you very much for coming to the show. Yeah, and no good luck for your next four years of Another term. Another four years. Yes. And don't forget, next week, same channel, same time. 
have your say on online shadow boxing.